this video, the middle-aged nerds discuss spoilers from books they read decades ago. Do you really need a spoiler alert? Do you really? Hi, I'm Glenn the Geeky Hippie. And I'm Matt Stagger, and this is Non-Terrestrial Half-Life, where we take stories we read in the first half of our life, we reread them to see if they still stand the test of time. And this time around, we are reading, you want to go ahead, Glenn? Yeah, Silverthorn by Raymond E. Feist, book two in the Rift War saga, the first set within the Rift War cycle, which is like 29, 30 books. Bill, do yeah. you remember when you first read this book? Um, honestly, my, my, my only memory really was I remember feeling a little disappointed that the first like quarter of the book, there was no pug. Pug who? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I remember that bothered me, but I mean, this time wasn't an issue. I think I was more invested this time. I, I I was a lot more invested myself this time. It's because of a certain character. I think you probably will agree with me on this character. Um, oh yeah, Jimmy. I really don't. Yeah, I really don't remember checking this book out. I don't remember what the book looked like, which cover. So I just picked this. Um. I, I just remember the story. I don't remember it. I'm sure it was within a month, a week's or month at the most of when I read Magician the first time. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure all of them were out by the time I picked up Feist. So, yeah, I remember the story and that's about it, you know? And, and even then, I tend to forget that this group of events happens in the same book this group of events happens in I, I because i've read the rift war trilogy rift war saga so many times like back to back to back that they kind of right. blur into the other books kind of like later wheel of time books do you know? well yeah i mean you you have those moments where you're like wait did that happen in that book or that book yeah and you can't pin that down sometimes um i'm finding it uh, you know like I said, I'm much more engaging this time. I, I I don't know if I just wasn't in the right frame of mind when I read this first as a teenager or or what, but not, I'm definitely but... enjoying it more this time. I've heard some people say this is their least favorite of the trilogy. Um, really? I don't know about that. Yeah. I, I, huh. I can't say I like it as much as Magician on this reread, but... I definitely think I like it since I read the trilogy earlier this year and then I am re, you know reread the trilogy earlier this year and then I'm rereading it again as we go each each episode I I think I like this one more than Darkness at Sethana. Um yeah I don't so I, I remember I think anything I think my favorites on these 3 is in the order they were published you know from top to bottom Honestly, this was right up there with Magician for me. So, you know, I'd say I enjoy oh, them both. I, yeah, I, I enjoy them both. It just, I, I think I enjoy Magician a little bit more. Um, although I did enjoy seeing more of Kelowna in this book. I'm always, yeah. as much as I don't like the Sarani's attitudes towards life, I love going to Kelowna. I, I think it's yeah. what I love. Well, I mean, you know, we, we get a little bit of the hill tribes in this one and, and their culture seems to, you know, uh, like they almost get along with the Sarani. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they do have a very similar stance on a lot of things to the Sarani, which, you know, I, I, I think what, what's the Hadadi? name i can't remember his name now i was just listening oh, God. To it. um i have it here hold on um uh, uh baru baru yeah, you know baru. I, I i even think baru was talking about at one point the sarani and, you know it, it was complimenting them and the, you know their sense of honor if i remember yeah. correctly he was talking about yeah him. he did he uh taught, they fought for three nights and three days and at the end they were surrounded uh, the hill tribesmen were until uh, I can't remember which duke it was showed up. Right. Actually, no, I think, I think it, that was uh, Laurie's buddy's story about the duke. You know that relief army showing up. 
No, it, it, was, it, was the, it was the Hill Tribesman because um, okay. he said he, he felt he might owe a debt still. The, what was um, the story? The, the story that he the one guy was remembering when they were all having those doubts, everybody but Jimmy was having those, you know, they were being influenced by something. They were having those doubts and or remembering. And then the one guy was remembering that battle, but then the Duke never came in time. Yeah, that, that was... The, was that was Lori's friend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, what it I thought you were referring to with the Duke. No. Um, when they first meet the Hill tribesman, he ends up uh, saving Arutha from the assassin in the bar. Yeah. And it's after that, that that he sort of tells the story about how Arutha's father showed up. And, oh, okay. Uh, broke right. the uh, Sarani. Duke Boric. Yeah. So. Okay. So we but had yeah, two he, different he, stories of relief relief forces coming. Okay. Well, yeah, one coming and one not. Well, not in when the they're ba- supposed in, to. In, 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 <laughs> well, in, in in the actual history, both of them came, but when they were when they were being influenced by that magic, I can't even remember where it was. Um, they, everybody but Jimmy was starting to have doubts or memories of where yeah. it was all like negative stuff. That was the one mercenary. He had the memory where they never came. That's where he, that's what it was, but in reality, the Duke did come. Right. What Duke was it? The Duke of Yaban, I think. I think. I it think was. so. Brukel, maybe. That sounds right. Yeah, I think so. But check out my notes. Yeah, I think it was. I didn't really take notes this time. I had to. I had a lot going on this week, so. Right. I, you know, on my on my reread, I'm like, man, I gotta I gotta take some notes. I know the story, but I didn't pay attention to a lot of the names. So I'm like, I really need to take notes. It's been a while since I read this on um, you know print. You know, I've listened to it twice this year in audiobook, and and it, sometimes I I think keeping track of names is easier when you're reading it in print because you actually see the name. You know, yeah, so I it think sticks so. In there- your head. Yeah, there's that word recognition pattern running in your head. Yeah. Um, what see. were your memories of reading this book the first time? I mean, did it stand out for you? I remember being really shocked and concerned and worried for Anita at the wedding when she first got shot. I mean, I the I, I remember the emotions I had were were pretty strong about that. You know, I, I actually, you know, at that age, I, I, there were still stakes. I hadn't realized that the stakes really aren't as high as they could be, at least in the Rift War saga, the, you know, the original trilogy. Right. Um, so, you know, I actually thought Anita might die, you mm-hmm. know, and so the whole way and it just, and, and I remember anxiety as the, as the party was being chased on the road by you know the black slayers i hate that phrase but um yeah i i just i I remember i was really roped in emotionally on the emotional beats and levels that feist wanted but then i was probably somewhere between 13 and 16 and that you know very emotional age so right well i mean i i i found like one of the most emotional parts for me was Jimmy's sort of guilt that he wasn't able to stop the assassin. And yeah. I mean, he did everything he fucking good. So it was heartbreaking to have him fall to his knees and just start crying, you know, at a, at a Ruth's yeah. feet and, and, and begging for self blame forgiveness. You know, I mean, it was self blame as a bitch. It was painful. Yeah. Well, I mean, especially for a kid. I mean, he's a kid. Yeah, I think he's 15 or 16 at this point. I mean, you know, he, he may be the yeah. awesomest kid in fiction, but he's still a kid. Could you imagine if him and Matt Coffin met? Dude, I'm imagining uh, Matt Coffin, him, and um, Kylar from uh, the Night Angel series. don't know that series yet. I haven't read that yet. I'm like, you put That's, them three uh, together, Brent man. They, yeah. Okay. They would absolutely just destroy everything even worse is if you add uh tasselhoff into the mix 
They'll go through it. That group will go through yeah. a house and there won't be anything left in the house. And I'm not saying Matt Cawthon's a thief, but he is a rogue. He, he, he is straight up a rogue in D&D terms. Not a thief, but he will pick up a stray dagger here and there. Yeah. You would know. I would. So, did this book change any of your reading habits, would you think? Because I... I I think it sucked me even further into epic fantasy, you know, high fantasy. If if I'm not mistaken, the first time I read these three particular books was in between Dark Tower books. Okay. So I was probably ansily wait ans nervously Just... waiting for uh the next book to come out in the Dark Tower. <laughs> so that may be why I didn't retain it as much as I did this time you were so focused well yeah right? i mean i i get like that once i get honed in on a series i get hyper focused on you know as you put it on like fantasy or science fiction you know for a while you know i didn't used to always be a mood reader but you know in my teens i started being a, a bit of a mood reader and it got worse into my 30s and 40s but you know i at one point used to be able to go from read a fantasy book, science fiction book, fantasy book, science fiction book, back and forth, not having any problem. But nowadays, sometimes it just, it doesn't, I, I'm like, I don't want to be reading fantasy, you know, and, or I don't want to be reading science fiction. All I want to read is fantasy. And yeah, I found as I got older, I definitely became a mood reader. I have certain books for certain moods. Yeah. And see, that's the thing. I, I've always described the Rift War books as comfort reads, you know, because they've always been, you know, a nice, cozy, you know, sit back in bed, curled up, nice blanket, mug of hot chocolate or coffee, cat on my lap, reading a book. And it just, when I, when I picture that, it's usually me reading a Rift War book. Sometimes a Wheel of Time book, but usually it's a Rift War book despite me being much more of a fan of the Wheel of Time in this series, which is just, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have Wheel of Time books that I'll listen to when I'm in a certain mood, you know, depending on what mood I'm in, which book. Um, I, one of my guilty pleasures is uh, lit RPG books. So I have some series that are in that genre that absolutely are comfort books. Yeah. I have yet to try one of those. I've thought about it, but just haven't gotten around to it. Well, the, the main issue is they're either great or they're horrible. Oh. <laughs> it's hard to find a middle. <laughs> they're either really okay. great or the ones I read are really bad. So, well, you nice. know, finding a middle ground, which, I mean, I don't really need to. If I got the great ones, I'll stick with the great ones. But there are some great ones. Yeah, let's see. The Riftware stuff, there are middle ground, you know, middle of the road books, you know, some there just, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Moderately good. That's not the word I'm looking for either, but there, there are some that are really good. There are some that are, oh, okay. And then there's a trilogy that's not really a trilogy. It's just three books under a title that really, really sucks. I think it's legends or legacies of the rift war it's uh the trilogy of books that he co-wrote with three different people uh there's an sm sterling and will and fortune and i don't remember who the other one was but it's uh it, it consists of honored enemy murder at lamut and jimmy the hand they're terrible they are just wow. i, I a, read a Jimmy them. book that's terrible yeah yeah, mid twenties. You know, you would think I liked it, but the right—I mean, the story itself was good, but the book was just terrible. It was terrible. Like Dragons of and, Summer Flame, terrible. Yeah, it was yeah. just like it took me forever to track them down because they had only been published in Europe uh, for the longest time, and you know, I. I I'd never seen them for the longest time here in the States until I ran across them at the library once. And I'm like, ah, oh, finally, I get to read these. And eh, I wish I had. I really do wish I had. 
in a way, because that was a waste of a week and a half reading right. those three books. I I don't think I read past uh, a darkness. I don't remember reading anything after darkness, honestly. But you do remember some of what happens to Squire James as an adult. Yes, I have bits and pieces, so I'm like I I either read it or I came across the information somewhere, but okay, I I have large chunks that I seem to remember from you know a do particular you, saga and i'm like maybe i read it and you, i just forgot do you think after we've read these first six vice books you're going to continue on on your own reading the rest um honestly i think it depends on the next three books um where well, i'm at now at, these three. where i'm at now i am more than happy to keep going i'm enjoying it if it hits a point where i'm not enjoying it then I'll set it down for a while and may or may not come back to it. I'll tell you the Serpent War saga and the Demon War. Saga, well, mostly the Serpent War saga. That's the one I meant earlier when we were talking before we recorded. Um, the Serpent War saga is just really, really good. I, it might be my second favorite entry into the cycle after the Empire trilogy with Jenny Wirtz. I mean, I liked it as much, if not better, than this trilogy. So, when you first read the book, who was your favorite character? Um, Arutha. Uh, yeah, or yeah, Arutha. Um, I, I, I was young enough in my life where I felt this sort of attraction to intense loyalty and things like that because everything was so uncertain in my own life i was more yeah. attracted to characters that were that fiercely loyal and everything so yeah i think my first it was definitely arutha i i think i have to agree um i've always liked arutha arutha's always been one of my favorite characters in fiction um so i, I you know I, I i i i definitely am pretty sure arutha was my favorite then right but he's not anymore my yeah, favorite no. character he wasn't mine on it, this reread either so yeah it was totally jimmy yeah jimmy the hand 100 percent um and he might be a gary stew by some people's estimation you know but the feet the male version of a mary sue but i i've seen people say that but i hate i hate that 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 term mary sue gary stew either one i don't um, think so because i mean there's plenty bad that happens to jimmy i mean yeah he's not you know his character every, is everything not based on just, everything rosy and pretty and everything he does works out it's it just he's too good of a thief they say for a 15 year old or even the age he was in the first book well he had to be to survive i mean that's not a mary sue yeah. trait that's a you know i'm it's gonna die character. if i don't it's a competent you know competent man trait yeah i mean so jimmy's definitely your favorite what, oh why absolutely do you think that changed why do you think um, that changed honestly it's gonna sound weird but he's the only one who kind of keeps a cool head throughout um there every Most character will have a moment where they're either anger takes over uh you know things like that well he does break down crying and guilt thinking he was why and he, he does hurt. but i don't necessarily see that as not keeping his cool i mean that's deeply okay. what he's feeling so i mean you know that that's kind of a logical reaction to that amount of guilt that he's feeling so you know I don't think I don't look at that as the loss of control. See, I I think the reason why I like Jimmy so much this is I, I've really grown a fondness for the adorable rogue type character. You know, you know, maybe not so much with rogue with a heart of gold that you know that's that's a different type of rogue. But I've played rogues in D and D and other role playing games enough mm -hmm. to and read other rogue characters you know and matt coffin who is my favorite character in all fiction 
um, any format or medium. Um, so I, 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 I've got a preference, you, I guess you could say, towards the rogue characters. You know, that's why Malcolm Reynolds is my favorite character on Firefly. You know, because he's such a rogue compared to everybody else. I aim to misbehave. Is exactly. Um, I think it's it's the fact that he sort of comes from nothing and the absolute worst that this world has to give. I mean, his mother was a prostitute, murdered pretty much in front of him. You know, yeah. he doesn't know who his father is. We do. Well, yeah. Uh, but, um, a, a, but out of that comes a caring, compassionate, and competent person. So anybody who can, who can pull that off and not just pull it off, but, but do it in a way where he's sort of taken into the hierarchy of the society coming from nothing, that, that kind of story just appeals to me. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. They, I do like stories like that. You know, I don't want to say rags to riches cause they don't always end up rich, but right. You know, it, it, it coming from nothing and becoming somebody, something. Were there any character flaws you noticed on any of the characters that you never noticed before? Um, yeah, you know what? I, I, Not I really. think Arutha has a misplaced sense of what his duty is. Is yeah, I can understand wanting to be the one to go search down the silver thorn, search down the cure. Right. for your fiance's poisoning. But he's the Prince of Crondor. He has responsibilities and duties that he's supposed to take care of at home. I don't think Arutha should have been the one to go on this mission. I don't even think Martin should have been on this mission. Yeah, I, you know? I'd say I Martin mean, would have been a logical choice if Arutha didn't go. Maybe as then as the like the leader of the expedition, um, but even Martin has responsibilities back in Crydy, which is how I unlike the audio book I was listening to. I do not say Crydy. Yeah, no, I it's Crydy. Where he got? Yeah, it, it's Crydy by definite, definitely Crydy. Well, that's weird because yeah, my narrator says it correctly. So maybe we're listening yeah. to different narrators. I think so. I think so. Um, but. I understand where Ruth is coming from. I mean, honestly, it, I do. if it was my wife or my job, my job, I don't care. I, I'm going to go do what I got to do to make sure my wife is okay. Yeah. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, there was a, there was a storyline on the show, the West wing where the president's daughter is kidnapped mm -hmm. and he steps down temporarily until she's you know, rescued. And, you know, he steps down as being president temporarily so that, you know, he can't be compromised. You know, he's right. not, he's compromised in that situation. <clears throat> um, but unlike Jed Bartlett, Arutha can't really step down temporarily. I mean, he, not, he, he's still the Prince of Crondor, even on his mission, but he's not doing his what he's responsible for he's got thousands millions hundreds of thousands if not millions of people he's supposed to be concerned about and i i i feel like I, I i fully understand where he's coming from yes but i i, I think his responsibility as do or prince of crondor should have overseen his responsibility to one person, no matter how much you love that one person, you know, that that's the sacrifice that's supposed to be made, supposed to be made by rulers in this sort of society that we have in this series. I mean, it's not like he didn't leave anybody in his place. True. So, but... I mean, he set things up in a way where everything can still get done. It just doesn't need his direct presence to get done. Yeah. So he's going to go take care of the one he loves. And I get that. I mean, I'm, I get it too. I just, I, I'm not I, mad I do about think it. It was misplaced. I'm not mad. I just think he had other responsibilities that in most other fantasy fiction, 
would have superseded the personal. You know, and that maybe not most, but in a lot of other fantasy, you know, noble, you know, the upright noble, you know, that we get in the Rift War stuff would be more responsible towards their you know their their sworn duties what things if any did you forget um from your first reading until your reread that sort I, of surprised you i forget about the eldar i can Ooh, yeah. I, I keep forgetting about the eldar i forget that pug Malan slash malamber actually interacts with the thun you know those centaur like yeah. people I forget that he interacts with them. Um, I, until I reread it earlier this year, I had completely forgotten that he went to Kelowan, went back to Kelowan at all. And I, and I think that actually might be some of my favorite stuff in this book is. Oh, it is. Kelowan. Yeah. When he opens the rift and goes back, it's, it's, yeah, I, I really I think be that. because it very much brings you back to magician. Yeah. So there was uh, almost a nostalgia to it, you know? I, I, I got to say that when I did my first re-list in this earlier this year, the level of anxiety I was feeling when Pug, Meacham, and Dominic, or whatever his name is, got captured, uh, and Hochapepa got captured while in Kelowan, right, was uh, some serious anxiety. I don't often get anxious for characters, you know, and even knowing that they don't die because these guys are back, I I still felt a lot of anxiety for their for their situation. Not so much this time, this last time, this past week, but yeah, really, because I had forgotten all about it. You know, I had forgotten yeah. all that happened. I mean, for me, I completely forgot all about uh, the Hadadi, the hill people, um, and then. I I I completely forgot about uh what are they called um the people living under the ice the Eldar, the Eldar. yeah I completely forgot the Eldar uh hundred percent forgot completely about that it surprised the hell out of me yeah I didn't remember them until he started going north from the uh, Kanzawai or whatever the the one the, the Shinzawai family. At that point, I remembered that there was uh, like a society or small group under the ice, but I didn't remember who it was or the significance yeah. of it. So, and even at that point, I, had, I I still didn't remember encountering the Thun until it happened. Yeah, like I, I don't remember this at all. That's like that's what twenty five, thirty years will do. Twenty, even twenty years, because I think I probably read reread this twenty years ago. I'm like, yeah, I haven't read this since I was, you know, like I said, a teenager. So I forgot. I don't I remember read. anything from the next book, honestly. Oh, see, I think this is my seventh or eighth time reading this book, but most of those were teenager and early 20s. Has your life experience since you first read that changed the way you look at the story in any ways or the characters or even um, the prose? Yeah, definitely. Um the first time I read it, I'm sure I saw Jimmy as a sort of contemporary. And now I see him as this kid who needs to be protected. So it definitely, yeah. it skews how I look at things. And as a father, it really skews how I look at his character. Um, And, and you're right. Overall, the stakes, they don't feel overtly sinister. Right. I think we've gotten used to that, you know, as fantasy readers, we've gotten more into that darker stuff, so. Which is why, you know, somebody like George R.R. Martin's The Song of Ice and Fire was such a fresh thing for fantasy readers because stakes were real. Characters did die. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people's heads will get cut off and there's nothing you can do about it. Magic ain't going to fix it. Yeah. And it. And it doesn't help reading this and knowing that not only is there one more book in this trilogy, but there's 20 some odd other books in the right. series, you know, so, you know, the world keeps going, you know, 
that any world shattering, you know, threat probably gets nullified some way, you know, otherwise, what are the books that come after it going to be about? So, you know, it, the stakes do get lowered that way. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like looking at how many books are in the Wheel of Time and getting to, you know, book three, where it seems like something has been accomplished and you're like, there's no way. Yeah. I, you know, there's no way. I got so many more books to read. There is no way. That's the end. So that's, that's where reading a series where you don't know how many books there are in it because, you know, it's still an ongoing series. Mm -hmm. is such an interesting proposition at least it really the is. author doesn't say that we're it's going to end at this number book um I, I i think i've read enough other stuff that was much more geared much more geared towards adults than this this was i don't want to say this is young adult but it's young adult books fiction if that makes sense you know not ya is in the category but for the younger set of people yeah, who read the 18 regular, to 25 right yeah i i'd say you know feist tells a good story but he doesn't have great prose he has workable prose i would say probably on par if not just a little bit better than brando sando who admits he doesn't have great prose, but he tells right. a great story. I think that's what Feist does, is he comes up with a good story and tells a good story. There, He has his moments, Feist does, um, where you know he'll have a couple passages that are just beautiful. Yeah. And then, you know, but there are, like a magician, there were a couple of moments, particularly having to do with the elves and their surroundings that are, you know, quite poetic. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense with, you know, being around the elves, their nature. Yeah. Um, were there any elements uh, in the story that sort of clash with today's uh, social or political climate, you think? There, they were problematic uh, for you? There's one phrase, there's one word that he's using it correctly especially at the time, but even especially with a more archaic form of the English, you know, modern English, you know, like the way Tolkien would have used it, you know, in his era of writing, or even before, like Shakespeare used it this way, black. People can easily take the black slayers or the black heart. And, and I've heard people in school when, you know, when author uses the word black in that way, some people, usually white people, get offended at the idea that that's trying to refer to black people. And it's just, it, I mean, it, it, I, it's, it, they're trying to say it's the same, using black the same way, you know, the same black. It, it, it's an awkward phrasing, I think. It, I, I, I don't think an author today, I don't think Feist today would have called them black slayers. And I don't think Tolkien today would have called them black riders, you know, dark riders. I, I, I think dark riders, dark slayers, you know, people get a little sensitive about the use of the word black, especially in negative ways. Well, I mean, that's like getting angry at, you know, a book on witchcraft talking about the difference between black magic and, you know, yeah. nature magic. You know, and it's not, I'm not saying I have a problem with it. I think it's right. No, no, it, I get it's you. awkward today. It's awkward today. I didn't actually cringe every time I heard it. I'm just like the first time I'm like, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that, you know? Right. And, and but I, I definitely have heard people complain about the word being used that way. Maybe not specifically for this book, but in other books and other fiction. Um, and it's just, it's not a complaint that I've really ever sided with, but it does, it, it does give it some awkwardness with modern sensibilities. 
Uh, for me, you know, the only thing I can really think of is, is the sort of lack of competently written women involved in the story. There is that too. There, you um, know, he like it. Like I said last video with with Nynaeve, uh Nynaeve Sedai. There are some women that he starts to write more of, and even some female POVs in his later books, um, especially his newest trilogy, which is not set on mid Kemia or Kelowan. It's a different setting. Um, but he's still, there are still plenty of male writers that, you know, you could definitely say write females better than him. Yeah, I mean, the the few we do get in this story are sort of tropes. Yeah, um, definitely. So, yeah, I, I think if he wrote it now, it'd be different. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it would be. Not just modern sensibilities, but his improvement as a writer. Right. Were there any themes that stood out? To you in this in this book, I mean loyalty that you might uh, not have noticed before. Of course, I didn't look for themes when I first read it. So, right, me either. loyalty. Yeah, loyalty was the big one. Uh, duty with everybody but Arutha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, he, uh, he was showing loyalty, so that falls back on mine. Yeah, so that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but loyalty is just really strong there. Honor. Yeah. Honor is, just, there's a strong, you know, you know, thing of honor running through, but that's the entire trilogy by far, you know, especially anything dealing with the Sarani. Right. But uh, as a matter of fact, there's, there's a scene in the next book that actually made me go tweet Taishar Saranuani. And then I was like, yeah, I know I'm mixing settings, but it, it, you know, the, the Sarani and their sense of honor is actually pretty badass in this situation. Uh, but well, that's, uh, that's kind of the thing is that, you know, depending on the situation, it could be a good thing or a bad thing. Speaking of senses of honor and tra honor traditions, do you think a Knight of Salamia would get along with a Sarani? Would they understand each other if they could talk, if they could communicate? Do you think they would understand each other? Um, no. And mostly, Very different. Be mostly because of the black, uh, the great ones. The black robes. Yeah. 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 Uh, mostly because of the great ones, you know, that whole setup and that hierarchy and the things. I don't see the Knights of Salamna going along with that. Um, yeah, they would have issues. But it, it's the reason why I ask is because it's two groups where they have, in my opinion, an overblown sense of honor. At times, you know, they both would rather die than have any sort of dishonor, you know, at, at all. And it's just like, really, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even in this in this book, when uh, when the assassination attempt happens, um, the Sarani who were supposed to secure the room, you know, uh, Arutha makes the comment that he had to stop them all from killing themselves in shame. Yeah, because yeah. they didn't think to look where Jimmy ended up looking. Nobody thought to look there. Well, yeah, you I know? mean. Jimmy only did because he had a he had that bump that tells him something's wrong, something's not right. Well, not just that. He just said, you know, if I was going to do this to somebody, being the right. little criminal thief he, he used to be and yes. everything, where would I hide? So he has that experience that sort of, you know, he's used yeah, to finding the nooks and crannies. He, he went looking in the first place because something yeah. told him something wasn't right. Yeah. You know, he, he, it's like some people have a bump for direction in, in fiction. He has a bump for something being wrong. Why they call it a bump, I'm not sure, but that's the phrase, they, the term they use for that. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go with uh, success, appealing. 
Uh, any other themes that stood out? I, I, I think mean, loyalty was just too too huge of a theme. Yeah, I mean, it was everywhere, and it was kind of the main focus of this book. So, but uh, would you recommend this book to readers today, younger readers, older readers, both? I'd recommend to both, but not somebody who thinks that, not somebody who says they're all-time favorite fantasy series is Malazan because I, I, I think Malazan, <laughs> somebody who likes Malazan that much, and this is not against Malazan fans because I've read the first three and I like them a lot. I, I, I think they're a bit more serious with their fantasy or, you know, at least that's how it feels when I talk to some fans of Malazan or I watch fans of Malazan talk. I don't think they would enjoy this series nearly as much. Well, I mean, uh, it, I've, re I've read and, the first and that's three what it in, is. in Malazan, and I need a break after I read each one. I'll, I'll, yeah. If if I read, you know, Malazan, I'll, I'll stop, read something else that's a little more lighthearted, and then go back to Malazan. Because if I just keep going and stay in that world, yeah, it's pretty depressing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm waiting on our friend Jim to be ready to read the next Malazan book and we're going to buddy read it together mm. it's been since i finished memory of ice last year like last spring and, and i didn't read any more malazan since i've just held off um or was it this spring maybe it was this year i've read 90 some of my books at this point i might have read it this year early this year i think I i'm in remember. mid 20s for books this year so uh, you haven't been reading much. I, I spend most of my time reading. Well, listening to an audiobook. Same thing. If I'm not talking with if I'm not talking with somebody, reading something online or talking on the phone or doing anything that takes brain power, I'm listening to an audiobook. Driving, doing dishes. I get up to go get coffee. I hit play on my audiobook and then come back, sit down and start watching my show again. You know? Yeah, I'm only counting new books, not ones I've already read and I, I'm uh, currently reading. See, I'm counting. To. I, I'm counting everything I've I've read except for short stories. You know, there's a couple of books. If I reread it more than once in the year, I only count it twice. I don't count it a third time, even if I'm reading it a third time. Um, then there, there's like two books that I've essentially done that. Three books at this point now, I've essentially done that too. You know, because some of it's like, I'll read like a couple chapters this week for this show that I'm doing. And then later on, read a couple more chapters to relate to the episode that we're discussing next. Even, even if that means skipping a bunch of stuff in the middle. Right. You know, I'll st you know, or I could skip a bunch of stuff in the middle. I'll skip some maybe. I might jump a little bit, but mostly I listen straight through. So, I mean, I'm under, uh, under counting when you get down right down to, to it. You know, on everything, I'm counting everything but short stories and anything down to second read. And that's what's got me up at 93 right now. Yeah, I have no idea what the total would be if I went through everything I re-listened to, because like I said, I'll mood uh, read. Who would you recommend this book to? Um, Honestly, I think it would be great just for anybody who's first stepping into fantasy. You yeah. Know? This Definitely. this this is a great series to sort of get. Okay, this will give you a foundation, and from there, you know, you can decide if you know you want to go darker, maybe stakes a little higher type thing. It's a lot easier to read, I think, for most people, especially new readers or new fantasy readers, right? To read than say the Lord of the Rings. Well, yeah. A lot of people don't like Tolkien's prose and the way Tolkien writes. I love it. But then I grew up reading that since I was like seven, eight years old. Um, yeah, it, but I know I, I see a lot of complaints that Tolkien's hard to read. And I'm like, okay. I yeah. I never had a problem reading them. My problem was the songs. Dear God, enough with the songs. <laughs> that after was my <laughs> that was after my the tenth or so reread of Lord of the Rings, I stopped reading the poems. I'd read them untold number, you know, 10 times before, you know, so I'd get to a poem and shoop, skip to the page where prose starts back up. 
You know? Yeah. I, I was reading the uh, history of Middle Earth series that Christopher Tolkien was putting out. And until I got to the Lays of Bell Orion, when I stopped because it was like mostly poems, I'm just like, nope, I'm not reading this. You know? I, yeah, the only I one I think I had back. trouble reading was the Cimmerillion. I just couldn't do it, man. Yeah, yeah, you're not the only one to have trouble with that book. I just couldn't. I've only gotten through it. I think I've only gotten through it twice, maybe a third time. I know I tried it a number of other times and just like, nope. Anything else you want to bring up? Anything in your notes? Um, No, I'm actually looking forward to the next book. You know, like I said, I, I is? don't. Um, a Darkness at Setheron, I believe. Sethanon, yes. Yeah, Sethanon. Book three. Sethron, Sethanon. The book so with a spoiler in its name. Well, yeah. Gee, I wonder it's where the dark book is. Book with a spoiler. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's at Sethanon, maybe. Maybe. I don't know where I'm getting that idea from. Call me crazy, but I'm thinking Sethanon might have something to do with it. Spoiler, it's written by Raymond E. Feist. So, <laughs> hey, you guys. Thank you for watching again. Please leave us a like, a subscribe, and share this video with your friends who might have read some of these books when they were young, too. And hey, don't forget to be awesome. See ya.